Greetings and welcome to the broadcast. I'm your host, and we have a very interesting and complex book report on this Kanarak India Sun Temple, it's called, but it's much, much more than that, we found out. Looking into this, we discovered a 50-year-old book that originally sparked our interest, and uh, you can see it right here. It basically just said there was a temple, there were some wheels that said there were only 12 wheels. There were really 24, one for every hour of the day, and it didn't say anything about them being sundials or how the British looted the thing and basically filled it with sand and carted off the <laughs> treasures. But they did talk an awful lot about these wheels. They were just a decoration. In just a moment, we're going to have a person with a filming in India how to use these dials, these wheels rather, as a sundial and demonstrate them where the tour guide actually blows a whistle and people look at a wristwatch for eight to 1,100 years. The last 800 to 1,100 years, uh, these things have been accurately telling the time. Hard to believe it could be lined up that way. Uh, the earth is really something. Now, when you look right here at this old book, you see how the wheels are kind of penciled in? The artist tried to pencil them in. Look what happens right here now that they've been excavated. You can actually see clearly. You can look at the, closely to the wheels. You can see the temples and some of the uh, things that were done. Now, on the end of the temple, like where, the, uh, excuse me, the end of the wheel, like where the rubber tread would be, there's also some designs that we're not really sure what these do, how they fit into the uh, possible sundial and later on moon dials. Now, we're going to go ahead and let's just take a look and give you a sense of the time back there. Let's get a couple artifacts. We'll bring up a coin here and a few things like that. And uh, then we'll go ahead to the narration of the gentleman who's going to show us how these sundials actually worked with these wheels. Okay, here's a little decoration here. And uh, we can try to get both of these things together so you can actually see what it would be like a completed. Now, we're not going to make fun of these guys uh, bowing down to idols. We'll have a scripture up here in a minute. But the moon is mentioned a little bit as something of a, of a device that sets time apart. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and bring up a quick scripture early on. You can see right here the moon's mentioned uh, about its enduring. So anyway, as we went through this 50-year-old book, it seemed to be almost like it was sanitizing the part about the magnets on top and sanitizing the construction and saying, oh, the sand could have shifted, and then it says it was built and it wasn't. Uh, after a while, you can almost recognize somebody doing a hatchet job. And when we found out Time Life was involved with UNESCO, we thought, well... Let's kind of take our beer goggles off, so to speak, and let the people at McEisencraft YouTube, let them decide. And so in just a moment here, we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at the slice of life. Here's an idol, and then go to that wonderful narration of how the uh, sundials work. Boy, how would you like to have something like this round? Now, this next thing you're going to see, a woman holding a spoon. Yeah, they had spoons back there. It's a very special concoction that made her breath real, real good. And we know the Kama Sutra book's been around. Here's an actual snippet of it. Two of the biggest things these rich people can do, if you read here, was to make lemonade and to put water in glasses and play songs. Now, these were some real rich people back then, but that's, uh, I mean, there you have it. That's uh, one of the things they did. Now, also the Muslims in this painting, I didn't realize that three of these Muslims had come down and were running a lot of India at one time till we saw this book report. And, uh, well, it, it happened. Next up, now again, this whole thing is carved out of stone. Look at some of these samples of, the, of actually being carved in stone. Very delicate 3D effect and very light. And then uh, it, it, just, it just has a, a language all its own, this kind of artwork. Okay, now one more look at the actual wheels down here. They told us there were only 12, but really there were 24. There's also horses. They say it was just a sun god's horse, but there's some symbolic imagery there. And soon we're going to get to the sundials and a little bit into moon dials and using the moon to tell time, which has been a real um, a, a challenge for us here at McGeisencraft to find these items. We were also able to finally find one of a photograph of Ptolemy's device, which will be coming up later here on the show. Okay, here's a little wheel here. If you see this wheel anywhere, you'll know what it is now. It's sometimes found on Friday. Okay, next up. Here comes the guy who's going to have the tour guide. This guy deserves a medal. Go ahead and take a look at this thing here. Stay tuned and, and see how these sundials well, work. ...of a tour guide, figuring out the time, and then I will explain how the sundial works. Folks, they're going to blow a whistle while they're trying to time the sundial. As you can see, 
the sundial is pretty accurate and people are amazed by it. Let's take a closer look and see how it works. The sundial has eight major spokes that divide 24 hours into eight equal parts, which means that the time between two major spokes is three hours. There are eight minor spokes as well. Each minor spoke runs exactly in the middle of two major spokes. This means that the minor spoke divides three hours in half, so the time between a major spoke and a minor spoke is an hour and a half or 90 minutes. Now, at the edge of the wheel, you can see a lot of beads. If you observe carefully, you can see that there are 30 beads between a minor and a major spoke. So the 90 minutes are further divided by 30 beads. This means that each bead carries a value of 3 minutes. The beads are large enough so you can also see if the shadow falls in the center of the bead or on one of the ends of the bead. This way we can further calculate time accurately to the minute. The sundial shows time in an anti-clockwise fashion. At the top, the major spoke stands for midnight and this spoke stands for 3 a.m. and this one for 6 a.m. and so on. When I place a finger or a pen at the tail of the animal in the axle, the shadow will fall on the edge of the wheel. Now, I simply note the bead where the shadow falls. Using the math we did before, I can easily tell the current time precisely down to the minute. Imagine how much time and coordination would have happened between the astronomers, engineers, and sculptors to create something like this 750 years ago. If you're observing closely, you would have two questions in your mind right now. The first question would be, what happens when the sun moves from east to west? Since the wheel is carved on a wall, the sun would not shine on this wheel at all. How can we tell time in the afternoons? Now, the Konark Temple has another wheel or sundial located on the west side of the temple as well. You can just use the other sundial that will work perfectly from afternoon until sunset. This is the second and the most interesting question. How do you tell time after sunset? There would be no sun and hence no shadows from sunset till the next morning's sunrise. After all, we have two sundials in the temple which work only when the sun shines. To this question, I want to point out that the Konark Temple does not just have two wheels like this. The temple has a total of 24 wheels, all accurately carved, just like the sundials. Have you heard of the moon dial? Do you know that the moon dials can work just like the sundials during nighttime? What if the other wheels in the temple could be used as moon dials. Many people think that the other 22 wheels were carved for decorative or religious purposes and do not have an actual use. This is what people thought about the two sundials as well. Believe it or not, people thought that all the 24 wheels were just carved for beauty and as Hindu symbols. About 100 years ago, it became known that this was a sundial when an old yogi was seen calculating time secretly. Apparently, selected people were using these wheels for generations and for 650 years, no one else knew about it. They say that when they asked him about the purpose of the other 22 wheels, the yogi refused to talk and simply walked away. And our knowledge of just these two sundials themselves is actually very limited. You can see how there are multiple circles of beads. You can see carvings and markings all over these sundials. And we don't know the meaning of most of them. 
For example, this carving on a major spoke has exactly 60 beads. Notice how in some carvings you can see leaves and flowers, which may mean spring or summer. Notice how in some carvings you can see lemurs mating, which only happens during winter time. So these sundials could have been used as an almanac for a variety of different things. Now, if this is how much we know about these two sundials, you can understand how limited our knowledge is about the rest of the 22 wheels. Notice that there are clues on these wheels that people have overlooked for centuries. Notice how a woman wakes up and looks at a mirror in the morning. Notice how she is stretching, being tired and ready to go to sleep in the evening. Now, was it any wonder with that sophistication why the yogis and the swamis said basically screw you when they asked about information? The Brits came, they filled the temple with sand, all the treasures have disappeared. I guess you would call that coalition partners of us done today. UNESCO is, you, you can't believe, trying to do the research for this project, how UNESCO and their social uh, engineering has come up time and time again. Anyway, let's get back to the, this is called a nocturnal. Well, we've just seen what the people in that temple have done. This is a device that you can actually use to try to tell time at night. And you can see how it kind of goes up there and how it works. I'll get a little bit better close up here for you. And uh, we would like to get one of these things made and try it out. Now, the next thing up, Sir Isaac Newton, there's a lot of stuff here, it was wrongly attributed that he made this thing, which is, this is an actual, right here, an actual moon clock. This thing works. You can tell the time using the moon. Now, a lot of people say it's too much mathematics involved. You have to change it by 15 and a half minutes or so every night when the moon moves. Uh, it's almost like hidden wisdom. I can't find out the skinny on it for sure. But you, let's let the guys and craft viewers decide. Now, here's one in China, an actual well, lunar dial. I'm going to have to overexpose it on purpose so we can get a little bit more detail. Not much here. The Chinese have a history of either giving a lot or, or, or not much in this stuff. Uh, now, back to the moon. There's 101 reasons we hear why you cannot use the moon to tell time. It shifts. It's not like, well, I don't know if that's true or not. Now, over this next statue, remember the beads the gentleman showed us here? Here's a statue over by a woman's stomach. Some of these beads could be for the sun, and some could be for the moon. Now, I'm not saying that's true, but if you look right here on the, her design, you see kind of a planetary alignment here. There's the arc of the beads, and in her head she has some too where the sun is. Unfortunately, she forgot to put her shirt on. But on the top there, when she gets up to those, uh, those beads in her hair, you can almost see a little shadowing down there. There's a lot we don't know. Now, hang on to your hat here. Here's where the politics come in with Bush, UNESCO making a power grab. They've currently taken over auspices of this temple. When you go online to try to find out information, you're sent to mandatory Holocaust studies. And I'm going to show, I, I can't believe it. Uh, you're going to be sent to how the water, UNESCO is going to control the water. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's hard to believe the, the, to get information about this place. If you look at the wind charts, we don't have the wind charts, but they have a special current that blows right in this area. It's really something. We're going to play some snippets of one of the head people from UNESCO who's taken over. They made a power grab on this temple, on this sundials, and they're just trickling out the information. Oh, do you recognize anything here? Okay, that thing in the center has like a thimble on the end of it. What's it hold? Oh, that's right. That's the wheel we showed you. Remember? That's the wheel there, so you can recognize this. Now I'm going to show you one more thing on the old wheel here in a minute. And then we're going to go ahead, get the politics out of the way, if you do your own research on this, and uh, find out about using this for a moon. Moon dials. Just unbelievable. All this stuff is carved out of rock. Let's just go ahead and drink this in a little bit here. So now we're going to get to the horses here in a little bit the horses that pulled the chariot. Now see, the, the old book just said there were wheels and horses, it didn't say anything about dials, and gave the wrong amount. Okay, reconstruction process taking place. And one more look about some of the details. And right in the center of the spoke sometimes has held some calibration information. Here's what's called pillars. 
Now, at first we thought this was one of the horses, but it's when you look down at its paws down there, uh, it doesn't look like a horseshoe down there. It looks like it's got claws, so we called this one wrong. Uh, see, that's not a horse's paw. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. Now, here's the sun going right in there, and we're going to put a little shot right there of the uh, another temple so you can see how the sun diffuses inside. It's made to have a single source. And then, of course, here's the Taj Mahal on top of that to just give you a sense how, when it was up and working, how this temple might have looked like, how the sun might have come inside of it. Okay, now look how much light comes off this thing. Think what they could do with a little bit of moonlight, possibly, uh, at the other temple, back of the Konarek Temple. Okay, there's the guy, and all the way down to the bottom. Now, we're, we're tired of looking at this, but we're now going to show how it really was sanitized back there. They kept this information down, kept it kind of hidden in that book, and we're just going to discard that book, but it did uh, kind of point us in the right direction. There's right where the sun goes through. There's two different kinds of rock. The darker rock was said to be harder. Again, the top of this thing, if you do the research online, they're going to say there was powerful magnets at the top of this thing. Some that had a would actually support a uh, a throne because it was also magnetized. All right, now we're looking at these tread portions with new eyes. Now that we know what to look for a little bit, as partial calibration aids. Okay, now the horses are going to be coming up. You can see these are the real horses that are talked about actually have horses' hoofs. They say they're, well, he, the guy told us there were seven of them for seven days of the week. There may be some other things, fragments going on. Now look at the knot tied on the neck of this thing here. That's all, not really a square knot, is it? Now look down in just a moment, down on the leg of the horse, there's like four bands. Those could be beads, I'm not sure. Now we're getting into the lunar stuff. Here's a quick shot of a moon coming down on the temple. Now this is artificial light, but if that was moonlight coming down... Uh, you might be able to tell maybe ways that we don't understand yet. You could either be... At, now, here, look at the light here. How the light, even during the day, the way this thing is laid out, is bright on top. Defined light. And here you can see the construction. Now, let's go ahead and leave Konarik now for a little bit. Take one last look at the Taj Mahal to see how light's bent around and reflected. and it's, It is pleasing to the eye. But I believe light can be collected uh, in the evenings. Now, this thing right here, here, other people, we just have a man in the moon kind of thing on a clock face. Not hard to tell time by the moon. Clocks do it. Grandfather clocks keep track of it all the time. You can buy something like this. Our, our flat earth friends like these kind of watches with a bubble on it. Here's a very simplistic. Now, UNESCO, hang on to your hat. UNESCO, we're going to have to actually look at a UNESCO propaganda piece right now. This is one of the top people at UNESCO we had to navigate through to find information on the Konarik thing. Note there's only two flags with this agency, and they're setting policy for Canada and the United States. And I thank the International Labour Organization and all our partners for raising our shared message across the world through national and regional events, including with UNESCO field offices. On this occasion, I appeal to everyone to join the chorus to promote together the sustainable management of the world's freshwater resources. My answer is, I don't know. But what I do know is that one minute in Auschwitz was like a day, a day was a year, a week in eternity. World at large. We must all remember. So we all must teach our children tolerance and understanding at home and in school. In the face of this poisonous challenge, I am convinced we need to respond to new discourses of exclusion and racism 
violent extremism through our soft power, through knowledge and critical thinking, through new skills for dialogue across cultures, through new opportunities for civic engagement, because we need to succeed together. Together with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we have launched the Conference for International Holocaust Education to take place every two years to train educators from all over the world. Well, there it is, folks. We look for some information on UNESCO and the Sun Temple. We got an Auschwitz study. We got the, well, it is a power grab. And, and you heard for yourself what it was. Oh, boy. Again, this thing is on almost under assault right now. Let's go ahead and look at just a few more things we've looked at before with our fresh eyes on. Why did UNESCO get a hold of this thing? Why did the Brits fill that temple with sand after looting it? Why, why did they give disinformation about the... We don't even know if 800 years ago was the right time or not. That's even suspect. Uh, in a minute, there's going to be a propaganda piece done cartoon style to show that some people think the temple was built, but others think that it didn't, wasn't really built. Now, let's get into some actual lunar stuff here before we have to have these politics tear us away. Here's a way here, in theory, you can use, you know, you can t things at night. This is a deal here you actually can use to tell time at night. Lunar clock, we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, here's a distance determining method. I'll let you look at that. And we'll pick up a, a couple tips. They say they didn't have the theoretical math. I don't know if that's true or not. Now here's Ptolemy's instrument. This is the one I. This was worth the whole trip here. I've heard about this thing. I'm not so sure if this is the real one or not. But this guy was a genius about planetary alignments and things. And uh, this is worth it just seeing this thing. I have no idea how it works. But I'm glad to finally be able to see one show it here in the McIsen Treff YouTube studio. Now here's the lunar clock. Now, notice they say that you can use a sundial or a sundial-type uh, item for this. Okay, we'll take a look at it. This, this begs some experimentation to be done. Now, to talk about, I hate to use the word propaganda, but here's the thing that at the Cambridge College is this thing right here. It says Newton was wrong when he was attributed to that. Now look at the weasel words. Cambridge, we've actually talked about them on other places here on the McGuys and Craft. We talk about the Cambridge Bible and how to use software that we show you how to use so you don't have to ask people a question. You can look it up yourself. But look at this here. It's just an exercise of mathematics. You can't really use the moon. You t and you talk about one of the most smartest guys around. You know they're up to something. Okay. We'll let the scriptures speak to us a little bit here talk about that moon. Ordinances. Okay, the moon can be used for ordinances. Maybe it can keep time, despite what uh, they tell us Newton could or couldn't do with that device. Now, read in just a minute here, to show you how easy it really is to do, look at the bottom of this thing, how it tells you how many teeth. A, a kid with a, a clock, basic clock-making skills can make one of these things here, and it'll keep perfect lunar time on an old grandfather's clock. Now, here's the idols. Okay. Now, typical idols don't do so very good, typically, in history. This will give us a picture of it. These are said somehow to do with the calibration. Okay, we're going to share a brief scripture here about idols, then we're going to go to the UNESCO cartoon. Yeah, you're not supposed to be around bowing around those things or worshiping them, that's, that's for sure. And this is kind of what they look like right here. This would be what one of them would look like. Okay, look at this cartoon. Is this propaganda or not?
Okay, did you get all that about some people believe it was built, some don't, some believe the magnets were taken away, some believe it caused shipwrecks? Well, let's get back to the moon. Jesus Christ mentioned the moon only three times I could find. Once here in the book of Matthew, once in the book of Mark, I believe once in the book of John. Here he simply talks about an end-time prophecy concerning the moon. Here, same thing, an end-time prophetic utterance. And without sounding, sounding like a denominational preacher, this next time, it's a little different derivative of the moon. And it talks about the sun and the signs. And This is the one where people get heart attacks from. Sometimes you'll hear scare tactics about getting a heart attack with the moon. That's during an end times prophetic scenario. Well, this guy got his hand knocked off, didn't he? This idol. Do you think the Bible says anything about that? Well, they don't want you making these things, number one. Graven image, they're, they're breaking a couple rules here already. Now, precious things from the moon. What do you think this does? Okay, the moon has light, brightness, light, different things going on here. We're not going to look at all 60 things in the Bible, but there's this is a calibration effect here that's, that's going on. Now we're going to come back to this broken arm. The Bible talks about things getting broken. Uh, here's an example. Lots of things fall down in the Bible. When they just displease the Lord. Arms of, of uh, idols get snapped off, broken off like cordwood. Walls get shoved over. Here this thing was probably shoved over. They're trying to put this thing back. We're not saying that like Jericho, the Lord visited a judgment on Konark, but... Who knows? The walls get knocked down in the old days. Uh, this thing could have been knocked down. It could have been something like that, and they're calling it a shifting of the sand. Who knows? Okay. Even Jesus, can people knock down around Jesus? Walls, all kinds of things. Well, anyway, back to the propaganda piece. Just quickly, the foundation was not strong enough to bear it, maybe. Hmm. Well, folks, we want to thank you for stopping by here. We're going to go ahead and sign off here in just a bit. Uh, this has been a puzzler. This has been a real puzzle. These big magnets and stuff, it, it's just almost a wild goose chase trying to get straight information about this place. Take care. Best to you. Lord bless to everyone. And bye for now. You know, folks, as we get ready to close out here, we pray for India. They have a lot of needs over there. Everything from cataract surgery to clusters of leprosy. To that end, we found a song that we think treats it very kindly. Got one goes something like this. Like a beggar, wandered and roamed. My life was just hopeless till I heard his name. A prophet, they said, heal the sick and the lame. Well, to find him was easy. I followed the crowd, but I kept to the edges, crying out loud, unclean, unclean, stay out of my path. I'm an object of scorn. I'm a vessel of wrath There on the hillside he taught us that day I never heard anyone say what he'd say Then he was done and his sermon complete I ran and I threw myself down at his feet I said, Lord, if you're willing, I know that you can Make me as clean as a natural man I know you can do it deep down in my soul. Oh, Lord, if you're willing, Lord, please make me whole. With a voice of compassion, he told me to stand. I'm willing, he said, and he reached out his hand. He cleansed with the words that he spoke with a smile. And in an instant, my skin was like that of a child. Now as time passes by, there is much we forget, but I'll always remember the day that I met Jesus the Lord and his first words to me. I'm willing, he said, and he